check out too. Um, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Ronnie, um, macular degeneration, can you provide insights into, first of all, explain what macular degeneration is, who tends to get macular degeneration, um, what, what in their diet may be contributing to an increased likelihood of macular degeneration and what people can do to avoid or, or repair if possible macular degeneration. Yeah, so macular degeneration is one of the leading causes of vision loss, um, not only in the United States, but around the world. And it tends to affect older individuals. Um, so individuals who are um, late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and numbers keep going up as the age increases. Uh, what happens is, and I can actually pull out my handy dandy eye model here to show you. So, um, so this is the eyeball, and normally we just kind of see the front of the eye, which is this part, but there's a lot going in on inside the eye. So I'm going to open it up to give you a sneak peek inside. Now, show you here, I'll remove some of these structures. So light comes in through the pupil here and hits the back of the eye. The back of the eye here is the retina. And the retina is normally clear, it's transparent, but it looks orange here because there's a lot of blood supply to it. And this yellow spot right here, represents the macula. And the reason why it's yellow is because of those macular carotenoids, the xanthophyll carotenoids that are yellow in color. So again, lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, they get deposited right here. And what happens in macular degeneration is that there's too much oxidative stress in the back of the eye, right here in the macula. And it leads to waste deposits uh, that don't get cleared by the cells underneath the retina those waste deposits accumulate, they grow, and then they cause inflammation. And then after that, so it's a sequence of events. After the inflammation, then there are new, there's a signal for new blood vessels to grow. And these blood vessels, they grow, and then they, uh, they tend to break and they bleed. And when they bleed, that's usually when people have significant vision loss for macular degeneration. So again, it's a sequence of events. It doesn't happen in a short period of time. Actually, it probably takes years or even decades for this process to happen, which is a good thing because it means that there is time for us to intervene. But once it becomes an, an advanced stage of macular degeneration where... Um, I should also explain that there are two types of macular degeneration. There's dry and there's wet. So the early stages tend to be the dry stages, but once the bleeding begins or once there's fluid, that is that is the, the wet stage. And the goal is to try to prevent someone from going to a dry stage into an advanced wet stage of the disease. And we know from clinical studies that, um, observational studies, that the more lutein and zeaxanthin people have in their diets, the people in the highest quintile intake of these two nutrients the lower the risk for wet macular degeneration, the lower the risk for vision loss. So there's a direct correlation between how much we're getting from diet, perhaps diet plus supplements, and the risk for vision loss from macular degeneration. And unfortunately, these studies, even though they were, they've been published, they've been out for 10, 15 years now, um, most ophthalmologists, unfortunately, are not so well-versed in the, in the studies. Most ophthalmologists, a lot of my colleagues, and I saw myself included up until I became aware of the importance of nutrition, really would just tell patients, we'll just wait and see, you know, everything's okay now. Um, we'll just monitor you once a year. And we never really tend to give our patients that much education in the nutritional aspect or the lifestyle aspect. And I think that really needs to change because Ophthalmology typically has been very reactive in terms of a field. Um, we wait until something happens and then we treat it with either medication or surgery or laser or injections. But really, we need to switch that narrative and be more proactive rather than reactive when it comes to eye disease. And macular degeneration is a prime example. Um, when people get, uh, when they develop wet macular degeneration, the standard treatment. Um, includes injections into the back of the eye. So these are monthly injections that patients have to get to prevent the, the bleeding in the back of the eye, prevent the fluid from accumulating. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not the easiest treatment to endure, but it does help to save people's vision. But, you know, why are we waiting until that happens? There's so much we can do prior to that. And there's also literature out there on lifestyle factors as well with respect to macular degeneration. One of the biggest risks is, is actually smoking. There was one study that looked at identical twins um, in which one twin smoked 
and the other twin did not smoke. And uh, they were followed over a course of many years. And the twin who smoked had a double, two times the risk of developing advanced macular degeneration compared with the twin who did not smoke. Um, other lifestyle factors include maintaining a healthy body weight, getting regular exercise at least three times a week. Um, and uh, and there's some debatable literature out there regarding other things like sleep and stress. Um, but hopefully over the next you know, uh, decade, a few decades, we'll have more insights into those um, lifestyle factors as well. How about diabetes? Is that a, a factor for macular degeneration? Um, so it's not an independent risk factor, but um, certainly uh, diabetes itself is a is a risk for diabetic retinopathy, which is a, a slightly different retinal disease. It can cause uh, blood vessels from uh, to form that are not normal, and also cause bleeding in the back of the eye and vision loss. So the ultimate pathway is similar, but they are two independent types of conditions. And um, once mac macular degeneration has begun, it can it be reversed through lifestyle changes if it's caught early enough or you, you're kind of stuck with it? So in my experience, uh, once people develop the deposits, the waste deposits in the back of the eyes, I have not seen them reverse. The goal is to prevent them from increasing in number and size. And these deposits, they're called drusen, D-R-U-S-E-N. And so again, in my patients, when I counsel them, the goal I tell them is to maintain your central vision, but also to maintain stability of your drusen so that those drusen don't keep increasing in size and number because as they do, there's more of a risk of the disease uh, uh, that it may progress into wet macular degeneration. So um, Dr. Tolfson, um, what issues most affect women and their and their health that can be impacted that well and specific uh, you know obviously there are you know certain things that affect everybody but you know you're you're no an OBGYN. so what female issues i guess we'll call them uh are, are most uh susceptible to being impacted in a good way by a whole food plant-based diet oh so um i would say so many different things um i think that it's i think one of the areas that i've been working with people recently um, and there's been a lot of interest around is the menopause transition and body composition um you know we see so many women it's starting about eight or so years before the final menstrual period where we start to see an increase in um in fat mass especially abdominally and a decrease in lean muscle mass and so um, and so I think that it's sometimes easy just to say like, oh, well, as long as you're eating, um, as long as you're not, you know, we don't need to get tons and tons of meat and I or tons and tons of protein. And I agree, we don't need tons of protein, but we need to make sure at least as, um, as women going through the menopause transition that we're getting adequate protein and the US RDA for protein for all adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. I love Brenda Davis's plant powered protein. She's an RD um, who's absolutely phenomenal. And she has a book called plant powered protein. And, um, and many people think the 0.8 might be a little bit low for women who are trying to increase their lean muscle mass. And if people are eating fiber rich plant protein only, they may need to bump that up at about 10%. So it's not a lot, but I think that women, when they go through that menopause transition, just need to be mindful of, are they getting enough protein, having protein rich meals or snacks every three to four hours. So really focusing on those beans and those seeds and those nuts and tofu and tempeh and, and soy milk, um, because it becomes harder to build that that lean muscle. Uh, so, and we also know it's synergistic with resistance training too. So that's just an area that I've really been focusing on. I realized that there were so many women who just assumed that they were getting, you know, since we don't need, you know, there's kind of that, that myth that we need tons of protein and we as whole food plant-based advocates know we don't need tons of protein. But I think that we also have to be careful that we're not just saying like, oh, well, we're sure we've gotten enough. And I think it's good for women to check in and say where are they at to make sure that they are at that like 0.8 or maybe a little above that in order to um, to increase their lean muscle mass when we see that decrease in lean muscle mass that happens with that menopause transition and you know the slowing of metabolism, all of those different things. And so that whole food plant-based way of eating that really decreases inflammation um, that helps to that that helps to decrease inflammation throughout the body, that helps to um 
help women weather that um, change in body composition that we see so often, I think is important. And then also when we look at when we age match men and women um, who are, who are thriving late in or who are living late into, uh, into later life, we see more functional disability in women. And so that's another thing that in addition to a whole food plant-based making sure that there's adequate protein way of eating. We also need to make sure that women are doing their resistance training um, and are getting adequate physical activity. We know that those, you know, the numbers are are pretty low um, for aerobic activity and then even lower as we get to like 65, I think it's about 10% of women who are meeting the physical activity guidelines by age. And when they used accelerometers, it was like, I think 2% of women who were in their 60s who were actually meeting those guidelines. So really important for women to be able to do their aerobic activity and to get in at least two days a week of resistance training. And it doesn't, you don't have to go to a gym. I don't have huge, huge muscles, but you need to be using the resistance bands or body weight um, or doing something that puts um, some stress on those muscles so that you can can maintain um, your lean muscle mass so that we can maintain our mobility so that we don't fall so that we um, can maintain our balance so that we can thrive so that we can do what we want to late into older age. And we look at all the research from the blue zones, those areas where people live the longer, healthier lives, those pockets of centenarians and nonagenarians. And, and we see that they're eating a plant forward diet um, and they're getting in their beans and nuts too. So that's actually the first I've heard that women suffer more disability as, as they age. What, what accounts for that difference between men and women? Oh, I, so I'm, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure as to what accounts for all of it, but I do know that women, they have, um, when we compare them to age match men, that women typically have an impaired ability to do the activities of daily living. Um, we see more difficulties with self-care, lower quality of life. They have an increased risk of falling, more hospitalizations, more nursing home admissions. Um, and so it's it's really important. And with menopause, we see that menopause typically comes along with an increased body fat um, increased body fat, increased muscle atrophy, decreased muscle strength, decreased bone strength. Those are just that um, those typical things that happen with menopause. And I tell women they are typical, but that doesn't mean that they're inevitable because with physical activity, we can decrease body fat. We can increase muscle mass, increase muscle strength, increasing bones, increase bone strength. And so it probably has something to do with muscle mass. It probably has, um, you know, muscle mass, bone strength, all those different things. So I'm not sure of the, the studies that show the specific reason as to why, um, but I do know it's extra important for women, especially during the menopause transition and beyond to be physically active and to be eating healthy, nourishing foods that support bone health, that support muscle health as well. Great, thank you. Dr. Ronnie, can you share a case study where dietary changes significantly improved a patient's vision or eye health? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of my patients, um, I'll call him Bob, he was in his mid sixties and he was very worried because both of his parents had um, wet age-related macular degeneration. So he knew that he was at risk. Um, he had actually had had some genetic testing done, which also confirmed that he was at high risk for developing macular degeneration. And what had happened was he'd seen other eye doctors before, and he was diagnosed with an early stage of macular degeneration. And he was really concerned that he would progress and ultimately go blind. And so he came to me for additional counseling about nutrition, lifestyle. So I put him on what I call the macular degeneration diet. Now, this is um, something that I know I put together based off of my research into ocular nutrition. And it's really um, rich in lutein and zeaxanthin primarily, but many of the other nutrients that we need for eye health. And um, and it's it's kind of, it's similar to the Mediterranean diet, but uh, much more again, plant forward than the Mediterranean diet. So um, so he began this diet and, and prior to that, he was taking, uh, he was basically uh, living off of a lot of junk food. And we know that uh, people who do live off of a lot of processed foods and refined sugars, um, omega-6 uh, rich, uh, an omega-6 rich diet, they are at higher risk for macular degeneration progression. So he never realized that. So once we shifted his diet, um, he lost weight. He actually lost about 25 pounds. And now I've been following him for about six, seven years. And he has been absolutely stable. He still has uh, 20, 20 vision centrally. Um, he still has good night vision. Um, he has not progressed. He's still in the early stage of macular degeneration. So 
Um, he's really, you know, very, very happy that he's remained at that stable stage. So it's not that it completely reversed, but the main thing is that he's been able to maintain his vision. And hopefully in the future, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, he will avoid the same, the, the fate that his, both of his parents, unfortunately, had. So um, I was reading a little bit about you and um, some of the things that, that you tend to treat that uh, you know are quite common are things like blepharitis. What would be a what, what is the what is blepharitis? What's the cause of blepharitis? And how do you as an integrative uh, doctor treat blepharitis? So blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelids. And there's actually two types. There's anterior blepharitis and posterior blepharitis. So the eyelid has multiple layers to it. Anterior means on the surface, um, there's inflammation. And usually that is associated with almost like dandruff, like flakes on the surface of the lashes. And it causes irritation. It can lead to dry eye. But usually the cause of anterior blepharitis is actually eyelid mites. Uh, there are mites that can kind of um, go get into the follicles of the eyelashes and causes inflammation. So there, it's called demodex mites. And so there are treatments for that. There are ways to de decrease um, mite infestation on the eyelids. And and one of the the best strategies I love is um, eyelid hygiene. And um, so I use uh, essential oils for this. Um, so this is something that not a lot of my colleagues, um, again, in, in traditional ophthalmology have really used in the past, but now I think more are realizing the benefits of using something like essential oils. And so tea tree oil, melaleuca oil, um, has been shown to decrease mite infestation as well as frequent eyelid hygiene. Um, the second type of blepharitis is posterior blepharitis in which the glands of the eyelids, we have these tiny little glands just behind our eyelashes and they secrete oils for our tear film. And so if the glands are not healthy, the tear film becomes unstable because not enough healthy oils are secreted and the tears evaporate leading to dry eyes. So 90% uh, of people who have dry eye actually have this posterior blepharitis. And so the way we treat that, or I treat that using an integrative approach is really to focus on a patient's diet to try to avoid um, pro-inflammatory foods, try to avoid diets that are uh, have a really high um, omega-6 to 3 ratio, try to balance that out, increasing one's intake of omega-3s while maintaining the omega-6s or, or cutting out the unhealthy omega-6s um, from processed foods. And so that's really made a big uh, improvement in a lot of my patients, as well as put it, putting them on an omega supplement. And um, in terms of other things that people can do for blepharitis, um, simple lifestyle things like uh, doing hot compresses, and doing them in the proper way and um, using eyelid washes, um, things like that can really make a big difference for the surface of the eye.